Welcome everybody to my presentation about the fundamental failures of endpoint security. My name is Stefan Fry, Research Analyst Director at Secunia. What we will do during this presentation, we look at the changing threat environment, have a look at how it relates to the malware development life cycle to understand what quality of malware we have around and what kinds of threats this poses to us and how does cyber criminals and the complexity of patching relate. First, let's have a look at the changing threat environment. We have here a small matrix on two axes. Horizontally, we have the players from script kiddies, hobbyist attackers to experts and specialists. And on the vertical axis, we have the incentives. Why they do something? Can be out of curiosity, for personal fame, for personal gain, so finances get involved, or it could be national states' interests. So, Wendell's typically are script kiddies working for personal fame or curiosity, they don't pose too much of a problem today. We have trespassers, the main incentive is personal fame and the uh, players go to more expertise like script kiddies to hobbyist detectors up to experts. Personal gain, so if finance is a major incentive it is usually hobbyist attackers or experts and Spying is when national interests are involved, states have uh, deep pockets to afford the expertise of experts and specialists. Now, interestingly, experts are the authors of the tools that we find today in the cybercrime landscape and experts working for personal gain, this is the fastest growing segment in recent years. This leads to tools created by the expert that are now uh, available and used by less skilled criminals and they are used for personal gain. So, today's cybercrime landscape, basically it's all about profit and politics. The tools created by the experts are used by less skilled attackers. So we have more opportunistic attackers and they are well armed and attacks can be automated to a very high degree. Tools are available in all shapes and colors or even as a service, what we call malware as a service. During this talk, the question is, what is the potential of this model? What are the preferred targets? So, let's first have a look at the malware ecosystem. How is malware created? Basically, malware authors use one-of-a-kind packages that easily bypass traditional antivirus. So, they use the same malware they have it in different colors, different uh, kinds, so it looks different to uh, antivirus and defense technologies every time, but it still has the same functionality. The result is malware that will not be detected by traditional signature-based antivirus, IDS, IPS systems, as well as static and behavioral monitoring systems. The main tool to achieve this resilience against detection is serial variants and permutations. Basically, a malware author produces multiple variants of his creation in advance of the attack. Each new variant is then released at scheduled intervals to constantly stay ahead of antivirus protection. For example, an author creates 10,000 variants of a specific malware functionality and releases a first batch of 1,000 samples. He monitors the defense industry like antivirus signature rules and as soon as his first batch gets detected, he releases the next 1000 samples. And he continues the game like this. Over time, he figures out that perhaps it takes antivirus four days to create new signatures of his uh, malware or against his malware. And then we will start to release the next batch every three days. So he can systematically stay ahead of defense technologies and antivirus and other technologies, they are constantly playing catch up. How do we get there? What we see here is the typical malware development life cycle. We start in the upper left where we have the original malware. We either buy the malware or we construct it with a do-it-yourself construction kit or we have some coders, programmers that code the malware that contains the specific malicious functionalities, say intercepting e-banking transactions, being a, a DDoS agent or a keyboard logger. 
After the original malware, we apply a crypto. And a crypto encrypts the code of the malware. So when you run the malware, you don't see the, the code of the malware. Only pieces of the code are at the moment decrypted, run, executed, and then the next piece is executed. So this makes malware very hard to detect. This makes malware resilient against reverse engineering and uh, detection and functional analysis to find out what they're really doing. Further, by seeding the crypto with different input, you get malware that looks different from the outside if you analyze the uh, executable, but it still has the same functionality. This is the key part for serial variant construction. Then you add a protector. Basically, the uh, malware gets defense mechanisms, so it will detect whether it is run in a virtual environment, typically used by analysts or on uh, defense VP uh, appliances. When it detects it is not run in a genuine host, it will not show the malicious behavior, which makes it very difficult for defense technologies to assess whether or not a specific sample is malicious or genuine. Then the malware is packed. Packing makes the malware sample smaller, which speeds up the uh, infection process and propagation process, and it has the further advantage that it will make detection harder. After that, we use a binder. So we bind the malware to a genuine program. This is a popular program that's often downloaded from the internet or whatever you need in order to support social engineering approaches. So say I send you an email, hey John, this is a cool diving computer, you have to try it out. But it is a diving computer with some uh, malware attached to it. So when you start it, you start a diving computer and the malware in the background. The last step is quality assurance. So you create 10,000 samples of your malware using this process and then you test those 10,000 samples against up-to-date antivirus engines. The samples that are detected, you discard them, the other ones you will use them in your attack campaign. So some screenshots of tools that you can easily find in the underground. We have a crypto to encrypt the malware. You see it's very easy to use basically which is the file you want to encrypt. You choose it. What is the seed? What are some properties you want to add to the scripted file? Create and it is done. We have another tool which combines the crypto and the protector. You see, click, drag and drop, many, many features you have, basically all defense technologies. There is some uh, feature in here to bypass it, uh, to block it or to circumvent it. Very too easy to use in a nice front end and you don't need any programming or scripting skills to use them. Other tools here, the binder, also very easy to use which is a genuine file that we want to infect, which is your malware file, create, done. On the other hand, we have an uh, antivirus detection tool, uh, antivirus uh, quality assurance tool. You see all the popular antivirus uh, products are supported here. Basically, you give it uh, a folder name, say, please scan all my malware samples in this folder. It will do so. At the end, you have a report. You can pass this report and script the creation of further malware or uh, sorting out the malware that is not detected. This is very highly automated and only malware that passes the antivirus test is used in a real campaign. So chances of getting through defense technologies are increased tremendously. If this is even too much for you, you can buy it as a service. This is a uh, red uh, remote administrative tool that you can buy. It is offered with a service level agreement and a replacement warranty if the creation is detected by any antivirus within nine months. For about $250 you get this. So that's very interesting, but uh, many people say I'm not a target. The argument however fails short as automated tools do not differentiate on that ground. An automatic tool doesn't know whether or not you think you're a target. If you have a vulnerability you get compromised. Another argument we hear very often is that there's nothing critical to stealing my infrastructure. However, criminals have plenty of uses for your bandwidth and CPU. They can 
use you to host malicious content, use as an infection point to spread malware or as an anonymization proxy to hide their activity. Or they sell your CPU power to break passwords as a service. Basically, today everybody is a valuable target for cyber criminals. So, what's the opportunity for cyber criminals? Basically, in a very simple model, it's the number of hosts of potential targets times the number of vulnerabilities we find on those targets. So, let's first look at the number of hosts. It is estimated by mid of this year, 2010, that there are almost 2 billion internet users. This is an increase of over 400% in a decade. This did not go unnoticed by cyber criminals. With almost 2 billion potential targets, business as well as end personal endpoints are increasingly targeted. Further, your PC, the endpoint, this is where the most valuable data is found that is protected. Whatever processes or setup you have, all your data protected on servers and so on, somewhere you work with the data. And it's very unlikely that you sit in the server room, cold, frozen, and work on the data on the server directly. However, you will have access to the data from your endpoint. So at the end of the day, as the business goes, you have access to the data on your endpoint, which is the least protected. To give you some real statistics, this is uh, data from Dambala, a company that uh, specializes in detecting botnets. They uh, analyzed several large enterprises and they found that up to 9% of the endpoint PCs in large enterprises are affected. And further, in 100% of the enterprises they looked at, they found infections. Those were very large enterprises, they can afford the best of breed in defense technologies, from antivirus to perimeter protection, IDS, IPS, and all this technology did not provide 100% detection. So, let's look at the number of vulnerabilities in this model. The question is, what does a typical endpoint PC look like? We know it's a highly dynamic environment, but question to you, what do you think? How many programs do you have installed on your typical Windows machine, be it at home or in the office? That's no easy question. And the other question that follows naturally is, how many different update mechanisms do you need to keep this endpoint up to date? 